Hi guys, how are you doing today? I hope you're having a great day. We're going to read chapter two of Dealing with Dragons. So just as a refresher, um, Cimmerine was scheduled to marry Prince Therindel because her parents wanted to marry her off and get her to be a proper princess, but she did not want to do that um, at all. So she met a frog and the frog told her uh, a long journey she could take to run away. So she has done that and she has reached the end of her walking journey and now she's inside of a hovel or a um, cave. Okay, so this is chapter two in which Cimmerine discovers the value of a classical education and has some unwelcome visitors. Inside the hovel was dark and cool and damp. Cimmerine found it a pleasant relief after the hot dusty road, but she wondered why no sunlight seemed to be coming inside through the cracks in the boards. She was still standing just inside the door, waiting for her eyes to adjust to the dark, when someone said crossly, "'Is this the princess we've been waiting for?' "'Why don't you ask her?' said a deep, rumbly voice. "'I'm Princess Cimmerine of Linderwall,' Cimmerine answered politely. "'I was told you could help me.' "'Help her?' said the first voice, and Cimmerine heard a snort. "'I think we should just eat her and be done with it.' Cimmerine began to feel frightened. She wondered whether the voices belonged to ogres or trolls, or whether she could slip out of the hovel before they made up their minds about eating her. She felt behind for the door and just started in, surprised when her fingers touched damp stone instead of dry wood. Then a third voice said, Not so fast, Warog, let's hear her story first. So Cimmerine took a deep breath and began to explain about the fencing lessons and the magic lessons and the Latin and the juggling and all the other things that weren't considered proper behavior for a princess. And she told the voices that she had run away from Salem by the mountains to keep from having to marry Prince Therindel. And what do you expect us to do about it? One of the voices asked curiously. I don't know, Cimmerine said, except of course that I would rather not be eaten. I can't see who you are in this dark, you know. That can be fixed, said the voice. A moment later, a small ball of light appeared in the air above Cimmerine's head. Cimmerine stepped backward very quickly and ran into the wall. The voices belonged to dragons. Five of them lay on or sprawled over or curled around the various rocks and columns that filled the huge caves where Cimmerine stood. Each of the males, there were three, had two short, stubby, sharp-looking horns on either side of their heads. The female dragon had three, one on each side and one in the center of her forehead, and the last dragon was apparently still too young to have made up its mind about which sex it would like to be, so it didn't have any horns at all. Cimmerine felt very frightened. The smallest of the dragons was easily three times as tall as she was, and they gave an overwhelming impression of shining green scales and sharp silver teeth. They were much scarier in person than in the pictures she remembered from her natural history books. She swallowed very hard, wondering whether or not she really would rather be eaten by a dragon than Mary Therindel. Well, said the three-horned dragon just in front of her, just what are you asking for us to do for you? I, Cimmerine stopped short as an idea occurred to her. Cautiously, she asked, dragons are, are fond of princesses, aren't they? Very, said the dragon, and smiled. The smile showed all her teeth, which Cimmerine did not find reassuring. That is, I've heard of dragons who have captive princesses to cook for them and, and so on, said Cimmerine, who had very little idea what captive princesses did all day. The dragon in front of Cimmerine nodded. One of the others, a yellowish-green in color, shifted restlessly and said, Oh, let's just go ahead and eat her. It'll save trouble. Before any of the other dragons could answer, there was a loud, booming noise, and a sixth dragon slithered into the cave. His scales were more gray than green, and the dragons by the door made way for him respectfully. Kazool, said the newcomer in a loud voice. Uh, chew! I'm sorry I'm late, but I had a terrible thing happen on the way here. A chew! What was it? said the dragon to whom Cimmerine had been talking. I ran into a wizard. A chew! Had to eat him. No help for it. A chew! A chew! Now look at me! Every time that gray green dragon sneezed, he emitted a small ball of fire that scorched the wall of the cave. Calm down, Roxim, said Kazool. You're only making it worse. A chew! Calm down! When I'm having an allergy attack? A chew! Oh, bother! Then said the gray-green dragon, Somebody give me a handkerchief! Achoo! 
Here, said Simmerine, holding out one of the ones she had brought with her. Use this. She was beginning to feel much less frightened, for the great green dragon reminded her of her great uncle, who was old and rather hard of hearing, and of whom she was rather fond. What's that? said Roxham. Oh, hurry up and give it here. Kazul took the handkerchief from Simmerine, using two claws very delicately, and passed it to Roxham. The grey-green dragon mopped his streaming eyes and blew his nose. Oh, that's better, I think. Achoo! Oh, drat! The ball of fire that accompanied the dragon's sneeze had reduced the handkerchief to a charged scrap. Simmerine hastily dug out another one and handed it to Kazul, feeling very glad that she had brought several spares. Roxham went through two more handkerchiefs before his sneezing spasms finally stopped. Oh, much better, he said. Now then, who's this that lent me the handkerchiefs? Somebody's new princess, eh? We were just discussing that when you came in, Kazool said and turned back to Simmerine. You were saying about cooking and so on. Couldn't I do that for one of you for a while, Simmerine said. The dragon smiled again and Simmerine swallowed hard. And possibly, but why would you want to do that? Because then I wouldn't have to go home and marry Therindil, Simmerine said. Being a dragon's princess is a perfectly respectable thing to do, so my parents couldn't complain. And it would be much more interesting than embroidery and dancing lessons. Several of the dragons made snorting or choking noises. Simmerine jumped and then decided that they were laughing. Ah, oh, this is ridiculous, said a large bright green dragon on Simmerine's left. And why? asked Kazool. A princess volunteering out of the question. That's easy for you to say, one of the other dragons grumbled. You already have a princess. What about the rest of us? Yeah, don't be stuffy, Warog, said another. Besides, what else can we do with her? Eat her, suggested the yellowish green dragon in a bored tone. No proper princess would come out looking for dragons, Warog objected. Well, I'm not a proper princess, then, Simmerine snapped. I make cherries jubilee and I volunteer for dragons, and I conjugate Latin verbs, or at least I would if anyone would let me, so there. Here, here, said the gray-green dragon. You see, Warog said, who would want an improper princess? I would, said Kazool. Oh, you can't be serious, Kazool, Warog said irritably. Why? I like cherries jubilee. Kazul replied, still watching Simmerine, and I like the look of her. Besides, the Latin scrolls in my library need cataloging, and if I can't find someone who knows a little of the language, I'll have to do it myself. Give her a trial run first, a purplish green dragon advised. Warog snorted. Ha! Huh, Latin and cherries jubilee, and for that you take on this black-haired snippy little- I'll thank you to be polite when you're discussing my princess, Kazul said and smiled fiercely. Nice little gal. Roxham said, nodding approvingly and waving Simmerine's next-to-last handkerchief. Got sense. Be good for you, Kazoo. If that's settled, I'm going to find a snack, said the yellowish-green dragon. Warog looked around, but the other dragon seemed to agree with Roxham. Oh, very well, Warog said grumpily. It's your choice after all, Kazoo. It certainly is. Now, princess, if you'll come this way, I'll get you settled in. Simmerine followed Kazoo across the cave and down a tunnel. To her relief, the ball of light came with her. She had the uncomfortable feeling that if she had tried to walk behind Kazool in the dark, she would have stepped on her tail, which would not have been a very good beginning. Kazool led Simmerine through a long maze of tunnels and finally stopped in another cave. Here we are, the dragon said. You can use the small room over on the right. I believe my last princess left most of the furnishings behind when she ran off with the knight. Thank you, Simmerine said. When do I start my duties, and what are they, please? You'll start right away, said Kazul. I'll want dinner at seven. In the meantime, you can begin sorting the tre treasure. The dragon nodded toward a dark opening on the left. I'm sure some of it needs repairing. There's at least one suit of armor with the leg off, and some of the cheaper magic swords are getting rusty. The, be the rest of it really ought to be rearranged sensibly. I can never find anything when I want it. And what about the library you mentioned, Simmerine asked. Well, we'll see how you do on the treasure room first, Kazul said. The rest of your job I'll explain as we go along. You won't object to learning a little magic, do you? Oh, not at all, said Simmerine. Good, it'll make things much easier. Go and wash up and I'll let you into the treasure room so you can get started. Simmerine nodded and went into the room Kazul had told her to use. As she washed her face and hands, she felt happier than she had in a long time. 
she was not going to have to marry Therindel, and sorting a dragon's treasure sounded far more interesting than dancing or embroidery. She was even going to learn some magic, and her parents wouldn't worry about her once they found out where she was. For the first time in her life, Simmerine was glad she was a princess. She dried her hands and turned to go back into the main cave, wondering how best to persuade Kazul to help her brush up on her Latin. She didn't want the dragon to be disappointed in her skill. Draco, Draconum, Dracone, she muttered and her lips curved into a smile. She had always been rather good at declining nouns. Still smiling, she started forward to begin her new duties. Simmerine settled in very quickly. She got along well with Kazul and learned her way around the caves with a minimum of mishaps. Actually, the caves were more like an intricate web of tunnels, connecting caverns of various shapes and sizes that belonged to individual dragons. It reminded Simmerine of an underground city with tunnels instead of streets. She had no idea how far the tunnels extended, though she rather suspected that some of them had been magicked, so that when you walked down them, you went a lot farther than you thought you were going. Kazul's section of the caves was fairly large. In addition to the kitchen, which was in a large cave near the exit, so there wouldn't be a problem with the smoke from the fire, she had a sleeping cavern, three enormous treasure rooms at the far end of an intricate maze of twisty little passages, two even more enormous storage for rooms for less valuable items, a library, a large, bare cave for eating and visiting with other dragons, and a set of rooms assigned to Cimmerine. All the caves smelled of dragon, a somewhat musty, smoky, cinnamony smell. Simmerine's first job was to air them out. Simmerine's room consisted of three small connecting caves just off Kazul's living cavern. They were furnished very comfortably in a mixture of styles and periods, and looked just like the guest rooms in most of the castles Simmerine had visited, only without windows. They were much too small for a dragon to get inside. When asked, Kazul said that the dwarves had made them in return for a favor, and the dragon's tone prevented Simmerine from inquiring too closely into just what sort of favor it had been. By the end of the first week, Simmerine was sure enough of her position to give Kazul a list of things that she needed in the kitchen. The previous princess, of whom Simmerine was beginning to have a very poor opinion, had apparently made do with a large skillet with three dents and a wobbly handle, a wooden mixing bowl with a crack in it, a badly tarnished copper tea kettle, and an assortment of mismatched plates, cups, and silverware, most of them chipped or bent. Kazul seemed pleased by the request, and the following day Simmerine had everything she had asked for, except for a few of the more exotic pans and dishes. This made the cooking considerably easier and gave Simmerine more time to spend studying Latin and sorting treasure. The treasure was just as disorganized as Kazul had told her, and putting it in order was a major task. It was sometimes hard to tell whether a ring was enchanted, and Simmerine knew better than to put it on and see. It might be the sort of useful magic ring that turned you invisible, but it also might be the sort of ring that turned you into a frog. Simmerine did the best she could and kept a pile in the corner for things she was not sure about. There was a great deal of treasure to be sorted. Most of it was stacked in one of the innermost caves in a large, untidy heap of crowns, rings, jewels, swords, and coins. But Simmerine kept finding things in other places as well, some of them quite unlikely. There was a small helmet under her bed, along with a great deal of dust a silver bracelet set with opals on the reading table in the library, and two daggers and a jeweled ink pot behind the kitchen stove. Simmering collected them all, along with the other things that were simply lying around in the halls, and put them back in the storerooms where they belonged, thinking to herself that dragons were clearly not very tidy creatures. The first of the knights arrived at the end of the second week. Simmering was busy cleaning swords. Kazul had been right about their condition. Not only were some of them rusty, but nearly all of them needed sharpening. She was polishing the last flakes of rust from an enormous broadsword when she heard someone calling from the mouth of the cave. Feeling somewhat irritated by the interruption, she rose and, carrying a sword, went to see who it was. As she came near the entrance, she was able to make out the words that whoever it was was shouting, "'Dragon, come out and fight! Fight for the Princess of Cimmerine of Linderwall!' "'Oh, honestly,' Simmerine muttered and quickened her step. "'Here, you!' she said as she came into the sunlight. Then she had to duck as a spear flashed through the air over her head. "'Stop that!' she cried. "'I'm Princess Simmerine.' Uh, "'You are?' said a doubtful voice. "'Are, are you sure? I, I mean—' Simmerine raised her head cautiously and squinted. It was still fairly early in the morning, and the sun was in the back of the person standing outside the cave, so that it was difficult to see anything but the outline of his figure against the brightness. "'Of course I'm sure,' Simmerine said. "'What did you expect? Letters of reference? Come around here where I can see who you are, please.' 
The figure moved sideways, and Simmerin saw that it was a knight in shiny new armor, except for the legs, where the armor was dusty from walking. Simmerin wondered briefly why he hadn't ridden, but decided not to ask. The knight's visor was raised, and a few wispy, wisps of sandy hair showed above his handsome face. He was studying her with an expression of worried puzzlement. "'And what can I do for you?' Simmerin said after several moments had gone by, and the knight still hadn't said anything. "'Well, um, if you are the Princess Simmerin, I've come to rescue you from the dragon,' the knight said. Simmerin set the point of a broadsword on the ground and leaned on it as if it were a walking cane. "'I thought that might be it,' she said. "'But I'd rather not be rescued. Thank you just the same.' "'Not be rescued?' the knight's puzzled look deepened. "'But princesses always—' "'No, they don't.' Simmerine said firmly, recognizing the beginning of a familiar argument. And even if I wanted to be rescued, you're going about it all wrong. What? said the knight, thoroughly taken aback, shouting, Come and fight! Come out and fight! the way you did. No self-respecting dragon is going to answer a challenge like that. It sounds like a child's dare. Dragons are very conscious of their dignity, at least all the ones I've met so far. Oh, said the knight, sounding crestfallen. What should I have said? Hmm. Stand forth and do battle, is the usual challenge, Simmerine said with authority, remembering her princess lessons. She had always been more interested in what the knights and dragons were supposed to say than in memorizing the places where she was supposed to scream. But the wording doesn't have to be exact as long as it's suitably formal. You're new at this, aren't you? <laughs> Rescuing you was going to be my first big quest, the knight said gloomily. You sure you don't want to be rescued? Quite sure, Simmerine said. I like living with Kazul. You like... The knight stared at her for a moment. Then his expression cleared and he said, Of course! The dragons enchanted you! I should have thought of that before. Kazul has not enchanted me and I do not want to be rescued by anybody, Simmerine said alarmed by the knight's sudden enthusiasm. This place suits me very well. I like polishing swords and cooking cherries jubilee and reading Latin scrolls. If you don't believe me, ask anyone in Linderwall. They've been complaining about my unprincess-like behavior for years. I did hear something about fencing lessons, the knight said doubtfully. But knights aren't supposed to pay attention to that kind of thing. We're supposed to be above the rumors and gossip. Oh, the fencing lessons were just the beginning, Simmerine assured him. So you see why I'm perfectly happy being a dragon's princess. Um, yes, said the knight, but he did not look convinced. Speaking of dragons, uh, where's yours? Kazul's not my dragon, Simrine said sharply. I'm her princess. You'll never have any luck dealing with dragons if you don't get these things straight. She's gone to the enchanted forest on the other side of the mountains to borrow a crate pan from a witch she knows. She's what? said the knight. She's gone to borrow a crepe pan, Simrine repeated in a louder voice. Perhaps you'd better have your helmet checked when you get back. They're not supposed to interfere with your hearing, but sometimes... Oh, I heard you, the knight said. But what does a dragon want with a crepe pan? She doesn't want it. I do. I found a recipe in the library that I want to try, and the kitchen just isn't equipped to handle anything but the most ordinary cooking. Because we'll fix that eventually, but for the time being, we have to borrow things like great crepe pans and souffle dishes. You really do like it here, the knight said wonderingly. Simmerine refrained from replying that this is what she had been trying to tell him all along, and instead said, "'How did you know where I was?' "'Oh, things get around,' the knight waved a hand in vague manner. "'In fact, I had to hurry to make sure I was the first. Half of the kingdom of Linderwall and a, prin and a princess's hand in marriage is a reward rich enough to tempt a lot of people who wouldn't normally bother with this sort of thing.' "'Fathers offered half the kingdom to whoever rescues me?' Simmerine said incredulously. That's more than all my sister's dowries put together. Oh, it's the usual thing in cases like this, the knight said mildly. Oh, it would be, Simmerine said in tones of deep disgust. Well, at least you can go back and tell them I don't want to be rescued. Maybe that will keep anyone else from coming up here. I can't do that, the knight said. It's just not done, Simmerine finished. I understand perfectly. She gave him a polite farewell, more because she had been brought well up than because she felt like being polite, and sent him on his way. Then she went back into the cave and polished the broadsword until it was mirror bright, which relieved her feelings a little. There were two nights the following day, and four more the day after that. 
On the fourth day, there was only one, but he was exceptionally stubborn, and it took Simmery nearly two hours to get rid of him. By then, she was thoroughly disgusted and even considered letting Kazul handle the knights from then on. She could not quite bring herself to do it. The knights would certainly attack Kazul as soon as they saw her, since that was what they were coming for, and sooner or later, someone would get hurt. Simmerine did not like to think that someone might be hurt trying to rescue her, particularly since she did not want to be rescued. So with a sigh, she decided she would continue to handle the knights as long as Kazul would let her. Prince Therindel showed up at the end of the third week. He was limping a little, as if his metal boots pinched his toes and the feathers atop attached to the top of his helmet sagged badly. He stopped and carefully st struck an impressive pose before issuing the usual challenge. Simmerine was not in a mood to be impressed. Besides, she could see that his helmet was a different style from his gold armor, and that the armor had gaps in the knees and elbows where they didn't quite fit together right. "'Aren't you a little slow?' she asked irritably. "'There have been eight knights here before you.' Eight, the prince said, frowning. "'Oh, I thought by now there'd been at least twelve. Perhaps I'd better come back later.' Simmerine stared at him in surprise. "'Why?' "'Well, it would look better.' Therindel explained seriously. There's not much glory in defeating a dragon that hasn't already beaten ten or fifteen people, at least. Sir Gorlax of Misterwald wouldn't even consider going after a dragon whose score is less than forty-five. I don't think I want to risk waiting that long, but eight just doesn't seem like enough. You're going to go away and wait until Kazul has defeated fifteen knights before you come back to rescue me? Simmerine said. She found Therindel's smug confidence very annoying, but she didn't like to say so straight out. Well, I mean, not if you'd rather be rescued now, of course, Therindel said hastily. Though you ought to consider the advantages, and I expect it won't be so very long. His voice trailed off, and he looked at her hopefully. I'm afraid it will be a very long time, Simmerine said with satisfaction. You see, Kazul hasn't defeated any knights at all yet. But, but, but I thought you said there'd been eight, Therindel sputtered. I said eight of them had come by. I didn't say they'd fought anybody. I sent them away. You sent them away? Therindel repeated, plainly horrified. But that's, that's... Not done. I know, Simmerine smiled sweetly. But I've done it, and I intend to go on doing it, so you might as well go home and warn your friends. They'd feel so foolish, you know, if they came all this way into the mountains to rescue me, and then had to turn around and go back home without doing anything. Well, they certainly would, Therindel said indignantly. What do you mean by playing these kind of tricks? Don't you want to be rescued? No, said Simmerine, losing her patience at last. I don't, and I'm tired of having my work constantly interrupted. So please, go away and don't come back. You can't possibly mean that, Therindel said. Besides, everyone expects me to rescue you. Well, that's your problem, Simmerine told him. I'm going to fix dinner. Goodbye. Before she could say anything else, before he could say anything else, she turned and ducked back into the cave, hoping the prince wouldn't follow.